Hello, this is Claire Barsky, and I am presenting Chapter 46, Gifted Education and Legal Issues, Recent Decisions. This chapter was written by Karn and Marqua. One thing you need to know before we get started is there is actually no federal government mandate that requires school districts to provide special education for gifted students. Oftentimes, citizens have to look to their state government for help. There are only 30 states that have passed a mandate requiring special instruction for the gifted. So among states, the funding differs. Most states choose to be permissive. Permissive means that districts may, but are not legally required to, provide programs for the gifted. This reliance on state governments makes monitoring gifted education at a federal level very difficult. So if you have a legal issue that involves gifted education, the best solution, because it is the most cost effective, most efficient, and least emotionally taxing, is to resolve the dispute at the lowest possible level. So an example would be if you believe your child is eligible for gifted but did not make the test cutoff scores, the best place to start is with the person responsible for testing. The authors suggest that you exhaust all informal and quasi-formal options before you go any further. If the complaint cannot be handled at the informal level, they are resolved through a ladder of different options. The ladder begins at the bottom with negotiation, mediation, due process, administrative review, and courts. The first step, and this occurs within the school, is negotiation. Before the negotiation, the dissatisfied party should gather relevant documents. This can include state laws, your state board rules, phone calls, and other points of contact. At the end of the negotiation, it is expected that the parties reach an agreement. If they do not, they may continue on to mediation. Mediation is the process by which disputes are solved in an informal manner. Parents and educators may request to use this process through the State Board of Education. It needs to be noted that only 21 states permit this. A mediation requires a mediator, and the mediator creates a mediation agreement within each party. If mediation does not work, you move on to due process. The most common type of due process for gifted disputes is the common due process procedures for all students. There is a requirement to bring written prior notice and an electronic or written transcript of the meeting. There is the option to bring students, attorneys, or witnesses forward. There will be a due process officer to make the final decision, and it is costly in time, money, and more adversarial in that it is more emotionally taxing. The fourth step is the administrative review. This is a face-to-face -face conference with a human resources representative or another person of authority. The participants will agree on a timeline of decision from said authority. The highest level you can go to, and sometimes it does go to this, is the courts. So your appeal may be taken to state or federal courts. Most are going to go to the state court first. The complaint complainant needs to know the current laws surrounding gifted education. And it needs to be said that this is costly in time, money, and emotionally taxing. And it could take years so the said student could be graduated from school by the time he finished. If you are going to the courts, the author suggests that you hire an attorney with a knowledge of educational law. So there are 12 common legal issues that I'm going to review in the following slides. I also chose a relevant legal case for each legal issue. So one of the common legal issues in gifted education is early admission. So early admission to public schools most students require, most states require students to reach a certain age by a certain date to enter school. It's most often September 1st. The best approach if you want to have your child admitted early is to check the statute to see if a permit, if there, if the school permits exceptions. One court case is the Doe versus Petal Municipal School District in 1984. The complainant had a four-year-old daughter who was assessed at a local college. The local college determined she was prepared to enter first grade. There is no, there was no kindergarten program at this time. 
The plea went to the county youth court, and the judge ruled in favor of the child. The school admitted the four-year-old. Another common legal issue is the provisions of programs. Many parents resort to the courts to force districts to provide gifted education resources because remember, we know that not all states provide funding for gifted education. Unfortunately, these attempts are often unsuccessful because gifted children are not a constitutionally protected class. An example of a court case is Bennett versus New Rochelle School District in 1985. So New Rochelle School District identified 109 gifted students, but actually only had funds to provide for 37 of those students. They decided a lottery drawing was appropriate and they used that to determine who would be in the program. Parents who child did not make it into the program via this lottery system were upset and sued the district and the court actually ruled in favor of the school system. Another big issue is racial balance in gifted education. So traditionally programs used to use only IQ cutoff scores to determine gifted students and we know that because of test bias these minority students are often overlooked. This issue is very commonly brought up with desegregation suits. Keys versus school district number one, and this was in 1995, resulted in a school developing more meaningful ways to determine giftedness, such as peer reviews, teacher recommendations, parent recommendations. Racial discrimination violates a federal laws, so it goes to federal courts. Parents can file a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, if they have one. Another common legal issue in gifted education is Carnegie units. And a Carnegie unit is just another word for a credit. So some middle schools will offer high school credits for gifted students. 22 states do grant Carnegie units to students upon successful completion of advanced courses. Another common legal issue is transfer of students. When a gifted student's needs, thought includes academic, intellectual, or talent, are not met by public school, parents may want to transfer the student to another district. An example of this is Davis versus Regional Board of School Trustees in 1987. In this case, the school denied the um, parents' petition to transfer. The court granted request of the parents, and this decision was further upheld in trial court. The children were given an appropriate education according to their abilities. Appropriate instruction is often discussed. What is appropriate instruction for gifted students? Many gifted students have an IEP and an IEP is an individualized education program. Many resource programs allow districts to set aside a particular time each week when student, gifted students meet. I know this was Forsyth County's manner of addressing gifted students. A big court case is the Centennial School District versus Commonwealth Department of Education in 1988. The Centennial School District used the research approach to serve its gifted students. And like I said, that's when the gifted students get pulled out for a particular time. The student and family believed he was not receiving appropriate instruction and requested that he receive it. This made it all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and the school was required to provide an individualized and appropriate curriculum for all students. Another common legal issue is the twice exceptional or gifted and disabled students. It often uses the Individuals with Disabilities Act or IDEA as basis. This act is more protective and supportive. A case that involved this was the Conrad Wisner Area School District versus Department of Education in 1992. The gifted student in question had a writing learning disability, but also a very high IQ. The school said that since he had a high IQ, he was not eligible to receive special ed services. The court decided that he was eligible for special ed services and gifted student services. So you cannot deny a child's gifted services because he, he or she is in special education or vice versa. So these are less common, but they still do occur. Teacher certification. So one such case is Johnson versus Cassell in 1989. 
And the case is about a teacher named Robert Johnson who applied for a gifted education position in the Hampshire County, West Virginia School District. He was gifted certified, had a lot of experience, and also had an advanced degree. He was not hired, and instead a candidate with no experience was hired. The court actually ruled in favor of Johnson, and he was given the position. Another issue is transportation. This has to do with getting kids to a place where their gifted needs can be addressed. Such cases include Woodland Hills School District versus Commonwealth Department of Education in 1986, and this was a court victory of public school busing for gifted students to instruction sites. Another common legal issue is tort liability, and this just means that as a teacher you need to take care of your students, and to do that you need to understand that although the gifted student is gifted academically and perhaps emotionally, they are not always able physically. So a really unfortunate case was Deering versus Plain Township. And in this case, a seven-year-old girl was permitted to get the TV cart as a reward for good behavior. And we remember that TV carts used to be very big. The television toppled on her and killed her. This is just, again, a reminder that although your student may talk like a 12-year-old physically, they are still a seven-year-old. Another legal issue is fraud and misrepresentation. And an example of a case is O'Neill versus Marjorie Walters School for Gifted Children. And the case said that the owner of the Marjorie Walters School advertised that teachers were certified in gifted education. They advertised that the school provided an individualized education plan and an appropriate curriculum. Parents disagreed with this claim and sued the school. The case was not resolved. At the end of the article, it questions what are the future legal issues going to be with gifted education, and the article put forth homeschooling, and they are wondering if parents are going to start asking for funds from schools to homeschool if the school cannot provide the appropriate education for their child. Thank you very much for listening.